Corey McLaughlin here from Stansberry Research with Zach Cass, former OpenAI head of go-to-market and an AI futurist. Um, we just got done listening to your presentation, and there's so many things I could ask you about based off of it. But I want to start with one thing you said, since we have an investing audience here. Um, the producti productivity boom of AI, mm -hmm. not priced into the market, you said. Well, I should say, and I'll be clear, I do not offer investment advice, uh, so I, I think that's probably an important uh, footnote here. I don't, think, I don't think anyone, including myself, fully yet appreciate what it will mean in a world of unmetered intelligence, which is basically pretty obviously one at this point we're moving towards. And so in a world where suddenly what you know and what I know sort of amalgamates and our computational power sort of amplifies by multiple orders of magnitude, we're going to see a world where things like entrepreneurship become rampant because the cost of running a business, starting a business, running a business, et cetera, decline rapidly and massively. Sam Altman has a prophecy that we'll see a billion dollar company of one person in the next three years. You don't have to believe in that, but the theory at least is very interesting, which is that running a business is just going to become exceptionally inexpensive. And that's going to present all sorts of incredible opportunity for people to create businesses. But more importantly, it will represent this massive deflationary event where the cost of doing, providing goods and services falls, falls rapidly. And I think that the easiest way to explain this is, is in this idea that one person will be able to accomplish so much more. Yeah, so entrepreneurship, one thing. But I want to ask you about like how this, how AI and like you know corporations as well. When people hear productivity boom, they're probably thinking with corporations to investors like profit margin, yep. right? Um, how do you see? And you work with a lot of companies as a you know, con consulting and, yep. and figuring out how to use AI. Um, how are the good companies doing it? What, what do they struggle with? Or you know, it it seems certain that we will. Um, see a world where most companies experience a, a, a you know, massive boon in, in worker productivity. It also, by definition, seems certain that it won't be a, uh, a way to differentiate against the market. Um, or if it is, it will be short-lived. And so then the question is, how will companies differentiate? And the obvious question is the negative space. In a world where intelligence is unmetered, what separates businesses? And so if I were an investor, the thing I would be most interested in exploring is what are the gates keeping any given company from succeeding? And to the extent that those gates are intelligence, we are gonna see, I think, a huge, huge boom. To the extent that those gates are regulatory capture, politics, um, uh, you know, societal thresholds, which we talked about, well, unmetered intelligence doesn't actually solve that. And so while there may be second order consequences to super intelligence down the road, the reality is these businesses will be less benefited by, by you know, the, the, the incoming AI revolution. And the things I'm most excited about are basically businesses where if you had a million more people working on a problem, it would be much better. And obviously bio and life sciences is one of those. Anything that's like any, any industry that's doing extensive research but also businesses where you know their costs are actually in computational, like rote computational work. Right. Yeah. One of the things that you said out there, a billion geniuses for those biolife sciences companies. It's that's really a way I haven't thought of it before. Yeah. Um, so, and also something you said about the companies that are adaptable are the ones that you said a lot of companies won't survive. Yeah. The ones that uh, aren't adaptable. Um, it got me thinking, like. This should companies have like an adaptation officer or something? Or, I mean, it's the, it's the AI, I guess it's AI officer. Yeah, that of course is like the lowest common denominator solution for many corporations, which yeah. is to just pick the topic du jour and hire a, a chief of it. Um, my favorite modern examples of adaptability as a strategy are Netflix and Southwest. And the Netflix story is told so often that it's almost, again, uh, like a, a tr you know a, a, tr um, a trope at this point. But Reed Hastings talks a lot about the fact that everyone knew streaming was coming. Everyone knew in 1998, after Mark Cuban sold broadband.com, that we were going to stream all of this content. Netflix had nine years to prepare for the, the streaming revolution. Everyone else did too. The only thing that separated Netflix from all their competitors was the fact that it was a company willing to explore this new information. 
And in a world where Blockbuster's most interesting asset and capability was real estate, its leadership team was run by real estate executives effectively who saw streaming as a threat to them. And so while they could have definitely told you, you know, with a gun pointed at their head, yeah, streaming is going to be a threat, there was something about the way the business was designed that it couldn't actually update, right? Adaptability was not in its cards. And so the, 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 the alpha in the market wasn't the information, it was the actual ability to, to, to execute on it. And the Southwest example is another one. Southwest after 9-11, you know, before 9-11 was a regional airline, it didn't matter at all. And after 9-11, the thing that separated Southwest from all the other airlines was that in a world where people are terrified of flying and the FAA was constantly updating rules, Southwest was simply the most adaptable airline. And it basically said, look, we, ha we have given our lieutenants, or the executives, and even the staff on the ground agency to move quickly. And it did. And now, of course, it's you know, the US's fourth largest carrier, or what was until recently. And it's just an example of what happens in a world where there are these critical, amazing moments updating to them, it becomes important, and my theory is that we will just have many more of them at a much shorter wavelength, and so being able to update to them becomes critical. Yeah, definitely. Um, speaking of that, the timeline for AI adoption you talked about, and mm -hmm. two of the things that were interesting to me were where it ended up uh, with kind of wearable technology, autonomous vehicles. Yeah. Why are you so certain? <laughs> you said you would stake your uh, I think career uh, on, yeah. on those things happening well, and being mass adopted. Natural yeah. language operating system is clearly coming, and you, you know, it'll, it, it, who knows if that name will stick. But the, it, we will live in a world where our machines are so agentive that we will actually, they will basically just do things on our behalf. The idea of using an application will be very foreign to future generations, unless that application provides some sort of entertainment. And you know your agent will interact with my agent to discuss things, and when you you know your agent will interact with a restaurant's agent to identify the perfect table for you, and it, it, they're just websites are going to become sort of chat agentive experiences, not HTML ones. That's obvious, I think. That is like if, that seems inevitable. The questions then start to, to extend, like what happens after that. But it feels, we know enough at this point to know that we are basically moving towards a natural language operating system that is a wearable, you know, with a personal device will be wearable. And it feels exceptionally unlikely that we sort of fight back against autonomous vehicles much longer. Because at some point, enough people will have been negatively impacted by the deaths on the US roadways that they will eventually say, hey, we shouldn't do this anymore. And obviously, at some point, we will stop seeing, and this is the societal threshold trigger that I think happens, Elon is trying to design these next generation of machines to look less like thrill car, you know, devices that we get thrills on the road from, yeah. and more like luxurious lounges, yeah. places that you are meant to read and talk and explore ideas that simply move you from A to B in the same way that your living room might move you from A to B. And the faster we move towards seeing cars as simply a means to get somewhere and less a means to explore our own autonomy, the sooner we'll arrive at the obvious conclusion that driving machines is actually exceptionally dangerous and totally unproductive for society. Right, the one thing I, I think about is how does like the regulation piece play into that, you know, government? Slow to move, right? Yeah, I mean, and, and are are they, are they going to let autonomous cars happen? Well, you heard my talk on the societal thresholds and technological thresholds. This presents, I think, the most interesting thing that we are now entering. The future will be determined not by what machines can do, but by what we what we want them to do. That's the obvious rate limiter, and the societal threshold th doesn't just mean our public perception; it means policy too. Yeah. You can keep the you know the the gates only for so long. At some point, there is an evolutionary convergence where the things that need to happen happen. And it happens, sometimes it happens slower than we'd like. But the obvious example today is you stare at the climate and you go, hey, we're, we're warming the globe. We should stop doing this. And then you look at why we did that. And well, it's because we burned trillions of tons of coal. So then you look at why we did that and it's because we made nuclear power effectively illegal. And so now the question is simply, okay, how do we race towards fusion and, and more sustainable energy? There are these incredible you know, forcing functions that lead us to these moments. It may simply be that we hold out on autonomous vehicles t so long that eventually people are like, the rest of our world is so safe, I'm terrified to go on the roads, and the government finally concedes that we should you know, automate the roadway. Interesting, yeah. Because in a world truly where we cure cancer, which we very well may very soon, and we're still driving cars, you're gonna be like, wait a second. 
my only risk of dying at this point is getting in that machine. I should definitely not do that. That makes sense. That I would be very I, crippling to the economy. I could see that happening. Yeah. Um, can you just briefly explain f what you mean by fusion energy to people who may not sure. have heard it, that term before? Yeah, fusion energy is simply a new way of, of uh, it, it's, it's a new form of nuclear energy that is much more efficient, has much fewer byproducts, um, and has a much longer half-life. Okay, cool. And then just switching gears to the talked about teens and you know cell phone use and you know, smartphone use and video games and mm -hmm. and that part of technology as well. It was surprising for me to hear I didn't know what to expect really coming in, mm -hmm. but it was surprising for me to hear hear you say um, like put your devices away to everybody in the crowd while you know while we were sitting there. Mm -hmm. um, why is that a concern to you? And it's not like you're. It, it doesn't seem to me like you think like AI is some perfect utopia yeah. um, scenario. I have, I don't know. I'm in, I, I'm like a hopeless romantic to some to some extent. I think I'm as much a humanist as I am a futurist at this point. I'm fascinated by the ways in which humans interact with each other and the ways in which we find happiness. And one of you know one of my core beliefs about the world is that we are happiest when we are in physical community with friends and family, ideally outside. I, I, I observe that empirically, we know that. And so in a world where I get to have a stage and talk about what I believe, one of the things that I like to do is basically tell people how I think they can live a happier life. And m my general take is that we're about to build a technology that's gonna automate so much of what we have to do, we're gonna get a bunch of time to do other things. And I, I, you know, I travel a lot, I, I get on a lot of planes, I sit in a lot of hotel lobbies, and I watch families all the time. Mm -hmm. And it is unnerving the amount of time that families actually spend interacting with each other when they are on vacation. And you, you can observe this, right? You can go to dinner, you can go to dinner, you can go to breakfast at a lot of these fancy restaurants, people who have everything, who probably, you don't even need to work, have just found ways to distract themselves with their devices. And you know, the parents, the kids, everyone. And um, it, you know, I, I'm just, I'm like, you know, as long as you're gonna give me a stage, I'll tell you what I think about this. Yeah. And I also, you know, when I'm speaking to audiences, feel better when everyone is looking at me. And so I, you know, I'm like, hey, as long as you don't mind, would you do this? Right. But I really do believe that it is this reminder to people as they're in the audience that they have an natural inclination to reach for their phone. Yeah. And it's, it's the simple experiment that I like to run with people. I don't have to say anything else. I walk off stage and inevitably people will email me and be like, you're right, I, I, I so desperately multiple times wanted to open my phone. And it is, it, you know, it's like, it's this thing that happens. We've rewired our brain to basically crave the device. Um, and that's the thing that we should be, I think at this point, one of the things we should be most concerned by. Yeah, it seems like more parents are getting concerned about it. You know, people who grew up F full life in the internet understanding. Do you have kids? I do, I have two little kids. Millennial parents are raising Gen Alpha very different than Gen X raised Gen Z. Yeah. And so I call out Gen Z fairly or unfairly as having these, you know, presenting these strange sociocognitive patterns, crazy high rates of depression and anxiety, um, much lower rates of, of large friend groups to the extent this matters, but I think it does. The proxy of, of um, sexual interest is like, is plummeting. Kids just aren't exploring the world the way that... It seems like a different world. Yeah. yeah, but Gen Alpha is actually presenting opposite trends. Gen Alpha is more social than, uh, than prior generations, and so that's great. And the obvious conclusion, in my opinion, is simply device time. All right. Thank you so much. We covered, covered a lot there. I'm sure we could talk a lot more, but I know we're uh, short on time. So Th Thank you for thank having you. me. Yep.